Let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I like that. I know, it's so fun because when they're the morning or the afternoon faith forums, we start at 11.30 and I always say, good afternoon, and everyone always says back, good morning. So when it's an evening faith forum, I can actually get it right. So I want to give you, everyone who's here, a very warm welcome and thank you for being here for tonight's Arizona Interfaith Movement's Faith Forum. I'm Nancy Linton. I am the Director of Outreach for the Arizona Interfaith Movement. And we offer these faith forums as a way to really learn what other faiths feel on topics of the day. Sometimes they're time, very timely topics. Sometimes they're more about <coughs> learning about a particular faith or faiths and, and their thoughts on that. And the Arizona Interfaith Movement takes no sides on any of the topics or the issues that we present. Rather, we provide these forums as an educational opportunity and really to model the golden rule in action, particularly golden rule dialogue and modeling how we can come from very different opinions and still be very respectful, civil and engage in conversation and even form friendships with people who are very different from us. So that's the purpose of these faith forums and again, thank you for being here this evening. Tonight, our topic is clash of conscience and it really is pretty timely. Um, here's what, it, what, what it's more about. What does your faith say about being obedient to government laws that contradict tenets of your faith? Does your faith take a stand against laws they consider unjust and potentially immoral? Or does your faith believe in following the full letter of the law? So this evening we have five panelists. I had invited one panelist, Dr. Ahmad, and um, I completely misplaced that I had invited him to be here. So I'm so honored and so grateful that he, he just was asked once. And usually I'm, I'm sort of reminding everybody because I, I want to be so on, on, on top of things. And he showed up and I'm like, that's so awesome you're here this evening. So thank you. So. Um, just very briefly, I'm going to tell you who our panelists are, but I'm going to introduce each of them right before they speak, because I don't know if you're anything like me, but when I get a whole bunch of information all at once, then I'm like, who was that panelist? So we'll do it that way, and I've heard that's more helpful. So we do have uh, Reverend Ken Heinzelman of Shadow Rock United Methodist Church on the end. We have Ahmad Daniels, and he's going to introduce himself tonight, later. And then we have Jackson Washburn. Oh, um, Ahmad Daniels is a member of the Muslim faith. And Ahmad Daniels, um, uh, Jackson Washburn is from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Dr. Um, Rabbi Mikhail. I think I need a lesson to learn how to say that. It's such such beautiful pronunciation. Uh, Rabbi Mikhail uh, Bayo and from the Jewish tradition, and also Tom Haynes from the Quaker tradition. So the first person that I'm going to introduce, because I'm going to pose the very first question to him, is Reverend Ken Heinzelman. He's from Shadow Rock United Church of Christ. And Ken grew up in southwest Indiana. <coughs> He graduated with a B.S. in philosophy from Murray State University in 1981 and from Vanderbilt Divinity School in 1987. He's been married to Peg for 37 years. They have three children and three grandchildren. Ken's worked as a minister, janitor, welder's helper, fast food worker, deckhand, drug and alcohol counselor, housing coordinator, mental health outreach therapist, and hospital chaplain. That's so wonderful because it shows the in our current age and time how many jobs and careers and professions so many of us have. Currently, for the past eight years, he served as the pastor of Shadow Rock United Church of Christ. And Shadow Rock is a progressive Christian congregation 
guided by the core values of inclusion, justice, and spirituality. Shadow Rock's interpretation of the wisdom of their tradition compels them to offer sanctuary as an imperative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to begin with Ken uh, because I know that Shadow Rock has been a sanctuary church and Ken's actually been featured on several, several news articles recently. I know I keep popping, keep, keep, he keeps popping into my news feed, NPR, he was on Sorry, NPR. Sure. That's wonderful, that's we're great. thrilled that, you're, that that's happening. Um, because we just like to hear about people um, from the interfaith movement. So here's the question that I'm going to pose to Ken. And Ken, you can share a little bit maybe about what you've been doing at Shadow Rock and, and take this question however it will best fit. If you've disagreed with a secular law, have you put yourself at risk by not obeying it? What have been the repercussions? Have the repercussions kept you from acting as fully as you might? And let's give Ken a warm welcome. First, uh, a little bit about the uh, about the Bible. One is that a lot of those jobs I worked while I was also a pastor, so I, it wasn't like I couldn't stay employed. <laughs> That's one thing. And then the, the other is, is that as of two days ago, Fletcher Michael Abshire was born, so I am now at four grandchildren. <laughs> so the. Shadow Rock has been offering sanctuary. It, we, it came to us uh, in such a way as here is a human being with a compelling story, and we're trying to uh, keep them in this country and keep their family together. This man had built a life here for uh, 18, 19 years, had the same employer for the last 13, 14 years, was a taxpayer, uh, fell in love. Uh, had kids, got a home, got a car, built a life, his kids go to school, and uh, it's the kind of human being you want as a neighbor. And so his story was compelling, and at that time, three years ago, there were administrative remedies for uh, uh, people to stay, people who are undocumented, for them to stay. And so often what they needed was just some time and some resources in order to navigate a broken immigration system. It's broken on a lot of different levels. Uh, it's broken in, in its very premise, and uh, we could talk about that some other time. Uh, but if you have a system that doesn't see another human being as a human being, but rather as um, somehow maybe subhuman, or as a number, or as a radically other than, and, and, uh, um, and yet as people of faith and conscience, we feel called to stand by all people. And even as, as an American, as, you know, I, I, I grew up, um, you know, I, I'm speaking out of my white male privilege, and I know that there's a lot of things wrong with that, but, but as a white, male, privileged young man who went to Boy Scouts and, and we said the, uh, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and you know, being aspirational. There's so many values of what I understand as a person of faith and as a, as a citizen that uh, these laws are not, uh, are not reflecting the way I understand myself and as a citizen and person of faith to be. And I'm fortunate enough to be serving at Shadow Rock, a progressive congregation, that, that we share values and we share a vision for what the world can be. And we share a sense of mission that we would work hard to um, uh, co-partner with God to, to create this world. And so all of that is consistent with us. Uh, anytime you see us, escalating our activity, 
especially this last time, it was in response to what the system did. The system lied. We wanted to have a cooperative advocacy with the system. And that's what we worked for for three years. And then it lied. People lied. And they were deceitful. And the fruit of that of those lies and deceit was to tear a man from his family and deport him. And what we did then was in response to that. We escalated our response because we believed that an institution, especially one that is supposedly filled with other human beings, people who represent our government and the best uh, virtues of uh, an aspirational vision of what it means to be a US citizen, they did not fulfill that. They were contrary to that. And we needed to respond to that. We couldn't let it go by without having a response. So we did uh, have a prayer vigil. We stood at the gate. And you know, what's kind of, what's kind of funny, I mean, there's a lot of things that are weird and funny about this in, in that uh, when, when Missy El Perez was in sanctuary at our church for 110 days, we would go down and on the 17th of every of every month, and we just did this again today, and we would pray and read a statement, and we would pray for the humanity of the people in the ICE building as well as for families that are affected. And we would put an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper on the gate, and two or three security guards would rush out. And they'd say, you gotta take that down, you can't be doing it, you're defacing federal uh, property and, and so forth, their life. and I, I'd say, no, we're not going to take it down because we want ICE to understand that you've robbed this man for however many days that the sign represented. And uh, so when Marco was deported, we said, well, we know how sensitive they are about their gate. And so we put signs and we put pictures of the family and we put a clergy stole because the stole represents moral authority as well as as servanthood, and we put all this stuff on the gate, and we never saw them. They never came out. So we put more signs, and they still didn't come out. We put a Mexican flag on their gate, and they never came out. So we tried to escalate to say, let's have a conversation, and we're not leaving until Marco comes home, and he's reunited with his family. But they never came out. And so we had to switch tactics, we decided we would show hospitality to people in the face of a building that knows nothing about hospitality. So, did we break the law? Yes. Did we break the law by giving sanctuary? It has yet to be determined. Many people say yes. Conservative lawyers say definitely. Um, would we do it again? I believe that we will be called on to do it again because I can't be trusted with their words. They can only be trusted by their actions. So, do we have any uh, pain in our soul, our conscience about it? No, we don't. So, I don't know that answer. That's I'm right. talking too long. No, that's I apologize. Good. So, is there anyone that would like to either respond on the panel that would like to respond? to Reverend Ken or answer the same question. If you have disagreed with the secular law, have you put yourself at risk by not obeying it? What have been the repercussions? Have the repercussions kept you from acting as fully as you might? Yes, um, and you're going to introduce yourself. She wants me to introduce myself, but I'm going to bypass my pedigree in the interest of time, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 50 years ago, this past April 4th, Dr. Martin Luther King took a stand, a very audacious stand, against the war in Vietnam. There were many people who came out in opposition to him and to his stand. They admonished him time and time again that peace and civil rights don't mix. But Dr. King was very clear, and I'm coming, to, I'm coming around, I'm taking a circuitous route, but I'll come back around. But he was very clear that he was not speaking out as a civil rights advocate, but that he was a minister. 
And those who fail to understand that distinction did him and themselves a great disservice. His opposition to the war in Vietnam was one based on humanity. And I draw on that because it was in 1967 that I received a 10-year sentence while in the United States Marine Corps for asking to speak with the commanding general and ask him why should black people go to Vietnam and kill yellow people and then have to come back and fight white people. Those who remember the summer of 67, tanks in the streets of Newark and Detroit and other cities where there were major insurrections occurring during that time. It's during that time that I adopted Islam. And whereas we're here to talk about one's faith and perhaps in opposition to the government, I venture to say one has to take a look at one's faith in opposition to one's faith. Because there's such a thing in, in all religions that's called universalism, which means that the tenets should apply irrespective of geography. If you're in Saudi Arabia, if you're in the Bronx, it should all apply. But what's overlooked all the time is what is called particularism. Particularism said one must take into said what must take into heart the conditions in any particular uh, locale. So whereas in Islam around the world, race isn't important, you're also supposed to not pay much attention to race. Being an African American in America, not to see race is to be blind. Not to be racist is to be foolishly uh, naive. So that's something that I'm, I wish to talk about as time for by. Because my serving, having spent two and a half years in jail of a 10 year sentence, and thank goodness for the ACLU, because had it not been for the American Civil Liberties Union, there's no doubt in my mind I would have spent most of those 10 years in jail and wouldn't have gotten, would have received a dishonorable discharge. But as it turned out, I received, I was discharged under honorable conditions, and I've written about it, and I'll talk more about the book and the uh, book signing that changing hands in Tempe at the end of the month of June. Thank you. Any other panelists for this question or in response to anything else? Okay. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to introduce uh, Rabbi <laughs> Michael Bale. He grew up in Milan, Italy, and has lived throughout Europe, Israel, and the USA. He holds multiple Orthodox rabbinical ordinations and studied at universities in Israel and the USA with a focus on political science, Jewish history, and Jewish philosophy. Rabbi Bale is a published author, university lecturer, and has taught classes and spoken to diverse groups ranging from non-Jewish to reformed, conservative, and Orthodox audiences on a wide variety of issues. Rabbi Bale is a dynamic speaker and community builder. After many years in the corporate world, Rabbi Bale has focused his efforts in the nonprofit sector and is currently the CEO of the East Valley Jewish Community Center in Chandler, Arizona. Let's help welcome Rabbi Michael Bale. And also Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And thank you, Dr. Larry, for making the connection and uh, Mitzi for inviting me. Um, in response to your first question, yes, I have. I believe that the question was uh, if I disagreed with the secular law, if you put yourself at risk by not obeying it. Yes, I do that every day. It's called speeding. <laughs> <laughs> and let's think about that. Every time you speed, you go against the secular law. And you put yourself in danger. That's what we do every day, maybe multiple times a day. And I'm, I'm starting with this uh, because um, we, we often, I, I think that too often, we tend to compartmentalize the big issues of immigration and civil liberties. And those are very, very important issues, but we forget that there are life is made of many, many more aspects of what makes us who we are and what makes us part of the community. And it's all those little things together, including the big things, that makes us who we are. Uh, and so, yes, next time you speed, know that you are going willingly, I believe, uh, against a secular law. Now, is that okay? 
Well, I would say that you are a criminal. And not only you are a criminal, you are a potential murderer. So let's think about that. The only excuse that you have, and the only excuse that I have, is that I haven't been caught yet. So, but that's the reality of things. In Judaism, and I believe that I'm here to speak about the Jewish faith. So in Judaism, uh, anybody who will come and say, Judaism says dot, 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 is either a liar or an ignorant. Because there is no such a thing as Judaism says. Because within the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition, Judaism being a religion that has been around a few thousand years, uh, you have multiple opinions about everything. <laughs> everything. I don't know if you know the joke, there was a guy on the Titanic, survived, he's able to swim to the nearest uh, island, and after many years, they come to save him, and they see that he has built two huts. And they say to him, what is that hut that you built? Oh, that's my synagogue. It's a place of worship. And what's that one? Oh, that's also a synagogue, but I will never step foot in there. <laughs> so that's, that's what we, we do. Uh, we're very good at arguing with each other and with ourselves. And so, to start with, I can only speak from, for me. I cannot speak for Judaism because nobody can speak for Judaism. It doesn't exist. This. In, I believe that there is a huge tension uh, in my tradition between following the laws of the land and not following the laws of the land. And those two, two competing traditions exist within our text. There is a very famous text that says, Dina del Marfut Dina, that the law of the land is the law. So if you take this text literally, no matter what the government decides, you gotta do, you gotta follow. That's the law of the land. You don't like it, pick yourself up and move. You don't like it, if you live in a democracy, use the democratic system to change the laws. You know, uh, you can also choose to take up arms and fight the government. Well, then you will be a criminal, just like the guy speaking. And then the question becomes, if you want to be a criminal. But, but, but that, is a the, that is not a secular law question. That is a theological question. Do I want to be a criminal? And that's a, and that's a question that everybody needs to answer for themselves. On the other hand, there are many Jewish laws that teach us that if somebody comes and obligates me to transgress the Jewish law, depending on which situation it is, I either have to transgress in order to save my life, for example, or in order to save somebody else's life, Sure, I have to transgress Jewish law. But that is only on condition that it is not done in order to discriminate me as a Jew. See, if somebody comes to me and says, um, Michael, I'm going to kill you if you don't eat this cheeseburger, then I have to eat a cheeseburger. I cannot say, sorry, my religion doesn't allow me to eat a cheeseburger. But if somebody comes to me and says, I'm going to kill you because you are a Jew, unless you eat a cheeseburger, then I have to let myself be killed. So there is a tension between following the laws of the land, even to the extent of letting myself be killed sometimes. And on the other end, not following the laws of the land, 
even to the extent of being killed. Thank you. Very thought provoking. Anyone else on this question? Yes. I want to tell you a little bit about Jackson Washburn. This panelist is only 18 years old. He is a senior in high school. He actually graduates on the 24th of this month. And Jackson is an amazing, amazing young man. He's a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. After being raised in an interfaith household for part of his life, he became inspired to found and lead the World Religion and Tolerance Society, a high school interreligious student group built around the values of respect, openness, cooperation, and understanding between individuals of various religious and non-religious backgrounds. And he's been doing that since 2014. He was also able to make the development of his club be counted towards achieving his Eagle Scout Award with the Boy Scouts of America. And this has allowed him to speak at venues such as the Parliament of the World's Religions in Salt Lake City, the United Nations in New York, and many others on the topic of youth interfaith work. Jackson plans on serving an LDS mission once he graduates high school, which is coming up right around the corner. After his mission, he'll be attending ASU to major in religious studies while continuing to engage in interfaith dialogue and activism. Please help me welcome Jackson. Um, well, you know, first off, I want to thank the Arizona Interfaith Movement for you know, providing this opportunity for us to come together and, and discuss uh, some of these issues. Um, like what was said, um, I'm both a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, and I'm 18, so don't let the beard fool you. You know, it's not too impressive. Um, uh, so, of course, I only speak for myself when you know I talk about my faith, my experiences, uh, and my understanding uh, within my own tradition. Uh, and to start off, I, I just want to kind of uh, lay down that um, despite uh, coming from a a restorationist uh, sect of uh, Christianity is what uh, Mormonism considers itself, um, and despite borrowing from a lot of Christian vocabulary, um, in, in many ways we defer in kind of the like core beliefs, and so uh, we don't necessarily have any any set creeds or uh, confessions, for instance, when it comes to our beliefs. Um, really, uh, the closest thing that comes to any sort of creedal statement uh, within our faith uh, is return. Uh, referred to as the Articles of Faith. Uh, when they were first composed, uh, they weren't even necessarily meant to uh, operate in uh, a manner that was confessional or creedal in any way. It was more of a, a response to what uh, outside um, individuals in society who weren't members of the faith were wondering about Mormonism. And, and so our founding prophet, Joseph Smith, um, he composed a list of 13, uh, what he considered key components of our faith. And I want to touch on the, the twelfth one uh, in specific. Uh, the twelfth article of faith reads, We claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, and we allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. And uh, this upcoming part is probably more relevant to what we're talking about. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates, in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And so, uh, Perhaps this is kind of unique, but you know, the closest thing that comes to uh, a creed within Mormonism uh, even includes uh, um, uh, a section which talks about uh, our obligation to uh, honor and obey the laws in, in the lands uh, in which we live. And so uh, for Latter-day Saints, this is something that we're raised uh, with, um, the sense of uh, being a, a good citizen, an active citizen, uh, is uh, very important to our faith, um, and it's very interesting to see how uh, both in history and across the world today, uh, with kind of the globalizing faith that Mormonism is becoming, uh, the, the various uh, challenges and situations in which Mormons are finding themselves. Um, there's another instance in one of our uh, sacred texts, the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, which is a, a book of, of modern revelation. Um, which reads, uh, Let no man break the laws of the land, for he that keepeth the laws of God hath no need to break the laws of the land. Well, that's pretty interesting, because 
I find it pretty rare that the laws of God, uh, according to what we believe, actually ever match what secular society deems them to be. Um, it, it doesn't matter what country you're living in, um, it, it's very rare uh, to have uh, those be consistent. And so I really liked what uh, Rabbi Beo was talking about when he talked about this tension that exists uh, within Judaism. I can say within Mormonism, this same tension exists uh, where you know we are obligated and, and in a lot of ways commanded to be active and dutiful citizens, but at the same time we have this obligation to be true to our faith, to be representatives of it, um, and throughout history uh, there's been interesting uh, situations uh, in which this has manifested itself, uh, both in the realm of civil disobedience, uh, but then also in kind of uh, setting aside some of uh, our own beliefs uh, for the sake of there being um, uh, obedience to the laws of the land. I'll, I'll give you a quick example, and this is one that's uh, relatively recent. Um, the country of Russia uh, has been taking motions uh, to move towards, uh, in a lot of ways, reducing uh, religious liberty uh, within its state. Um, more recently, uh, that's affected uh, a lot of minority faiths, for example. Uh, one that's been on the news recently has been uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, recently, the uh, Russia, uh, their Supreme Court has has ruled them an extremist group, and so there's a it's kind of up in the air right now whether or not uh, Russia is going to be able to seize the assets of the various Jehovah's Witnesses Kingdom halls. Uh, there is uh, several, um, perhaps hundred thousand uh, or or tens of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia, and so it's kind of a big deal for uh, members of that faith group. Uh, because uh, there are minority faith uh, within Christianity, for instance, much like the LDS faith is. Um, and at least as far as the LDS faith is concerned, uh, Russia has uh, ruled that we can't... Uh, well, one thing that Mormonism is known for, of course, is its, uh, its missionary work, its evangelizing, right? You've seen the, the, the guys uh, about my age on bikes, you know, riding around... Uh, and of course, that's what I'm going to be doing pretty soon. But in Russia now, uh, missionaries aren't allowed to uh, proselyte or uh, evangelize outside of uh, their places of worship. So outside of churches, uh, they have to be designated zones where that can take place. Uh, they're not allowed to talk about their faith uh, on the streets. Um, and so if individuals are interested in learning about Mormonism, it has to take place uh, exclusively within uh, churches and church buildings. And they're not even allowed to be called missionaries anymore. We call them volunteers now. This is an, a situation that's come up in which the LDS Church has been like, okay, we'll go ahead with that. You know, that, that's not something we necessarily have to follow. Um, and so they've worked with the government of Russia uh, to kind of uh, allow that to take place. Uh, we hope that uh, more uh, religious liberties uh, aren't taken away, such as the precedent might be with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but this is an instance in where the, the church itself has chosen to kind of just go along with what the, the, the laws of the land are. Uh, that's something that they don't necessarily deem as uh, too threatening to our faith. Um, and that's something we're, we've chosen to, to kind of give up for the interest of the common good uh, of, of those involved. So we, we're very much uh, in certain situations uh, more leaning towards uh, taking advantage of democratic institutions in order to uh, make change occur uh, when we feel such is necessary. So, uh, at least in this question, I, I have uh, more examples I'll be sharing tonight uh, that uh, differ from uh, this instance, but uh, I thought I'd share that for this one. Thank you so much, Jackson. Wonderful answer. Um, we haven't heard yet from Tom, and so I'd like to introduce Tom, and I've got, if this question doesn't fit for you, I've got a question that perhaps you can start off with. So let me just find your, 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 uh, there it is. <laughs> Tom Haynes became a member of the Phoenix Quaker Meeting, Religious Society of Friends, in the mid-1990s, and has been an active participant since that time. He's currently the co-clerk of the meeting, in the capacity that he guides the monthly business and represents the Phoenix Quaker meeting in official activities in the larger community.
Tom is a retired social worker and currently teaches as an adjunct faculty at Glendale Community College in the Social Science Department. He has a BA in Anthropology and an MA in Social Science from NAU and an MSW from ASU and afterward taught part-time there in the School of Social Work. Please help me welcome Tom. And I have this question which, may, which uh, Rabbi Bayo touched on. He really, he really did a great job of describing it from the Jewish faith. So I'd like to, to ask if this is the same in the Quaker tradition. Um, we tend to think of all beliefs within a faith and its members as being the same and congruent throughout. Is this true within the Quaker community, Tom? Does everyone see eye to eye? You have a good sense of humor. <laughs> First of all, Rabbi, I didn't know the Quakers were Jewish. So, <laughs> so much of what you say is, resonates so much. And it's nice to be on the dais with another Eagle Scout. <laughs> um, I bore you briefly with a little bit of history since the Quakers seem to be kind of a mystery religion for a lot of people. We are, in fact, uh, not Amish. Uh, even though on that Quaker Oaks box, <laughs> so we don't have to speak German. And that sort of thing, so. um, the Religious Society of Friends emerged during the English Civil War in the 1640s, a time of terrible bloodshed and violence. And uh, I'm sure this affected many of the original what are called testimonies in the Quaker faith, one being pacifism not supporting war, not supporting violence. Um, also, from the very beginning, being actively involved in what we would call social uh, progressive movements and reform, probably because half the time most Quakers were in jail. <laughs> and so, to this day, Quakers are very active in, in the penal reform, uh, both here and in around the world. And so, from, I suppose, a very practical standpoint. Um, Quakers um, do not get along all the time, and uh, um, we have multiple meeting houses, two of the same block, too, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we need to talk. Um, for instance, on the west side of Phoenix, there's a Quaker church. It's called the Quaker church, and that emerged in the uh, 1800s. There's a big split. Big split, and uh, so a group moved off and they decided they wanted pastors and group hymns. And if any of you are Protestants, if you go over there, you'd be quite at home, be very familiar to you. Uh, the meeting, the Quaker meeting house, is what's called the unprogrammed Quakers, or old school, or sometimes we're called Orthodox. Um, this is the silent meeting. We have no pastor. Everyone who's a member is a pastor. And the concrete example of that, for instance, would be when someone gets married in the meeting house, uh, everybody who's a member signs the certificate. So, oh, wow. so it's a big certificate when we take it out of the <laughs> county government. And that had to be battled out in court uh, over the years, too. Uh, uh, it's, it's also our, our tradition to not take oaths. So if we were called into court, which I was one time, we uh, we will not take an oath. We, we promise to tell the truth. The courts now recognize that. They didn't always know that. So uh, our faith asks us to be honest at all times, not only in the court. So that's some of the concrete examples of what we call our witness to our testimony. Have I been in trouble with the law by taking a stand? Not yet, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> possibility. Um, there's a long tradition of civil disobedience in the religious society of France. And, uh, along throughout American history, a number of examples would be, for instance, the Underground Railroad. Um, one of the first individuals involved in smuggling slaves out of the South uh, were, were Quakers in uh, Pennsylvania. We call Pennsylvania our, uh, that's our Vatican. Remember William Penn? 
Um, and that was a direct violation of both federal and state laws. And some Quakers were arrested and uh, again thrown in jail. And so they were visited by other Quakers. Uh, during the World Wars, uh, Quakers took an active uh, opposition to it. Some Quakers decided to go and fight, and you can do that in the Quaker faith. You're ultimately responsible to God, not to your meeting house. So there's a great deal of responsibility about personal decision making when it comes to these very deep issues. God for us sometimes we'll call the light or the inner light. This is important. That's why our Quaker meeting is a silent meeting. There's not a lot of talking going on. And uh, we joke that if you come there, you'll get the silent treatment. By the way, you're all welcome. Um, in the silence, we believe that this is where you go inside and to listen to the deepest aspects of what we believe is God. And if you wish to speak during that hour, you can. Sometimes people can sit through an entire meeting in an hour and nothing to say. And that's okay. So you're not required to. Um, so we have a long tradition. Uh, we are currently, uh, I'm sure this coming Sunday, we'll be discussing um, the Quaker Meeting House as a sanctuary house, too. But Quaker decision making is frustratingly long. Okay? It's not majority vote. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time on these decisions hoping for everyone to be in agreement. If you don't, you have the obligation to quote, stand aside, unquote, and not be in agreement with the meeting. And that's perfectly acceptable as well. So um, those are some of the issues, uh, some of the structure in uh, the religious society of France. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. I didn't know very much about Quakers, and so thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I want to go back to Pastor Ken and ask the same question because I am interested about the United Church of Christ, as some of you may be also, because they do seem to be very, very socially active and social justice issues and things. So um, the question again was, we tend to think of all beliefs within a faith and its members as being the same and congruent throughout. Is this true within the United Church of Christ? Does everyone see eye to eye? Which again, probably would be a miracle if everyone did, but I'm interested particularly in the areas of the sanctuary church and things that you're doing. No. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me say that um, the United Church of Christ uh, is a denomination I'm very proud of, but uh, but it's a human construct. And I go so far as to say all religions are human constructs. And so we're all trying to figure it out and what it means to be human and what it means to, to be connected to mystery and to be connected in right relationship to each other and to build the most just society. And uh, that's a never ending enterprise. And so in the United Church of Christ, no, uh, we are not all the same in that way. But I think that, that, that the differences can better be explained, not so much in terms of theological content, but more probably in terms of emotional and spiritual maturity in the process. And that is that someone who has the notion that, that um, rules are rules and rules are meant to be obeyed uh, because uh, you know, you get to the point of a social contract. If, if you don't obey the social contract, then everything falls apart. Um, so that um, this is why God ordered the world in such a way and put leaders into place and and uh, so forth on that line. But uh, but if you believe then that um, a kind of universalism. That is uh, what it means to be human. Uh, is is a mystery that we're that we're working together to figure it out, and that God is calling us in that. And that history is this long arc uh, bent toward justice and, and peace. 
uh, then, then it's a process and it means that the human institutions of religion and government are, should be questioned, should be challenged. <coughs> and so we have within the United Church of Christ people all along that continuum of emotional and spiritual development, emotional and spiritual maturity. So that, um, you know, I'm doing things at Shadow Rock for the last nine years that um, I would not be able to do at the United Church of Christ Church that I served in Ohio. And, you know, we would have done our best to have the discussion and try to figure it out. Now, to Shadow Rock, I would say that when it came to um, being open and affirming to LGBT, persons, but when it comes to uh, putting water out in the desert, when it comes to offering sanctuary to undocumented persons, that we have, we have people at Shadow Rock that are everywhere from being actively against it, passively against it, neutral, passively supportive, and actively supportive. But what has happened by offering sanctuary and and people at the church are meeting undocumented persons and their families. They're learning their stories. They are seeing uh, the real human beings and getting to know them and love them and care for them. The needle for Shadow Rock has moved in every way toward a more positive immigration narrative. So that those that were actively against it have become passively against it. Those passive against become neutral. And I had someone come to me a couple of years ago, and they said, Ken, I don't agree with what you're doing. Kind of like a Quaker set aside, uh, said, I don't agree with what you're doing, but I'm not going to stand in the way. I'm not going to sabotage what's going on here. And uh, that person has now moved into a position of being even neutral. So those are the kinds of emotional and, and spiritual processes that are going on internally with individuals that affect a community ethic. And our community ethic then is driven by, uh, uh, indicated by, by values, and a vision for the world, and a mission. So what's the vision informed by? What are the values informed by? They're informed by our faith tradition. So, you know, we find ways to articulate this. Uh, sometimes we, you know, very long-winded, as you can see right now. <laughs> and, uh, but, but there are other ways. For example, to simply say, Look, Jesus was, Jesus was executed by uh, organized religion and the state. Now there's something going on in those entities. And what is going on in those entities that really go against what it means to be the best human being you can be in the best human community? And, that is, and, and that's true of, of human beings. It has nothing to do with any specific religion or government. It just has to do with emotional, spiritual, social processes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, passed in the uh, sixth century, there was a question as to what direction Islam would take? Would it be the successor of the, of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, or could it be a gathering of wise people coming together to determine what route that would be? So when the question comes up to all Muslims, think like right back, right, go back to the sixth century, we find dissension in the ranks. Bringing it up to current day, it <coughs> remains the same nowadays. And I find that wherever you find Muslims to be the, in the universal sense, or in the particular sense, they're dealing with certain issues that are relevant to them in their locale. The whole idea about Islam in uh, black America became quite evident that it became real, it was quickly realized that if the Islam was brought right from Mecca or Lahore or any other place around the world, it would not have been received because what was happening in Saudi Arabia was not gonna t t address the needs in South Bronx or South Central LA. So it had to be something that was more relevant. So who comes to the surface at that time was a man by the name of Elijah Muhammad. And you've heard of him, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, uh, Louis Farrakhan, and many others. 
And that's what I think makes religion pertinent. It makes it relevant. It must address the social needs of the people. If there are prostitutes, it's got to find a way of taking the prostitutes off the block. If people are homeless, they have to find a way of creating shelter for them. If they feel that they're inferior because of an institutionalized white supremacy and white privilege exists, it must challenge that. Not by calling the others names, but by uplifting those to whom the burden has been placed on their shoulders for centuries. And that's where I find the intersection taking place between religion and race. And for people who fail to see that, and my brothers who come from the Middle East, I see them at the mosque. Well, you know, Farrakhan has no credibility because Islam cannot be taught that way. I ask them to jump into my shoes. Go back, ask Allah to make you black in America, and then come and talk to me about what you just said. Anyone else on this question before I go to another one? Okay. So, thank you. Recently, a baker refused to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. As a private business owner, does the baker have the right to refuse service to whomever she or he wants? Or is this simply a case of out-and-out -out discrimination? Should there be different rules for private versus business sectors? And again, you're answering from your own faith tradition on this, what you feel, and if there's been any incidences where you might take a stand on this, or if you just would have let you know, what would happen here? I thought you might like that one. <laughs> um, well, coming from a faith tradition, which at least in America is made up by around 85% Republicans, uh, you know, a lot of people are interested in this question when it comes to uh, balancing civil and religious liberties nowadays. Um, and, and without interjecting uh, both my own politics or the politics of uh, perhaps your average Mormon uh, in America into this, I, I would say, at least from the faith itself, um, if you remember the article of faith that I read, uh, you know, we believe in honoring and obeying the laws of the land. Um, and, and so in this instance, um, uh, you know, the Mormons can take this uh, a lot of different ways, um, and, and really their own personal politics uh, will probably dictate um, how they how they approach uh, this topic. But um, I can say with my church that uh, in the past you know decades or so, uh, where you know we've been thrown uh, in the spotlight alongside a lot of other uh, perhaps more conservative uh, Christian groups um, on topics such as this. Uh, nature, um, that for the most part, uh, we want to uh, work towards creating understanding between people. Um, I, I would say that's been the focus, uh, because this is an, an instance in which, uh, yes, there would be sensitivities uh, uh, in both parties involved, uh, potentially. And so we want to uh, allow people to engage civilly um, and, and open up dialogue uh, so that uh, problems such as this, uh, issues such as this, uh, might be uh, resolved peacefully. Um, I would say, uh, from my own perspective within my faith, uh, that you know, baking a cake is a very small um, uh, sacrifice to make when it comes to uh, what your faith dictates. Um, I, I would say Mormonism teaches to, you know, love first, um, and you know, if rules, you know. Uh, perhaps get in the way of loving someone uh, that they should perhaps you know break them you know as much as we see in the example of uh, Christ uh, in the New Testament in his life um, of course it's just Jackson talking uh, but you know I can say that you know my, my faith has taught me to both be an active citizen uh, to obey the law to love other people and again this creates a, an interesting tension when you throw it all together uh, because these are very much personal uh, uh, situations. Um, now, uh, perhaps in a different circumstance, uh, a different approach might be taken uh, in, in which one's religious views are kind of thrown into question. Um, but I think uh, a lot of these situations are very unique and, and personal. Um, and first and foremost, uh, whoever the Mormon is that they're involved, they should be more uh, focused in loving others you know, and extending that first, uh, rather than you know, perhaps letting their politics also get into their 
form of religion. So, uh, at least with this specific case, uh, that's, that's the answer that I can give to this. Thank you, Jackson. And I just want to say something really briefly. I know I'm the moderator, but I heard something on a Christian radio station the other day. It was a music station, and I heard this, and I thought it was a very fascinating reflection of our times. Um, they were talking about how in our current world right now, or at least in the U.S., there are many, and I know Rock Fremont always talks about the nuns, meaning that they're not affiliated with any religion or any spirituality or anything. And they said that um, there's so many people that are uh, not associating with any particular denomination, faith, or anything. And they said, you know what? That really makes us, um, they said on the radio station, as Christians need to do a better job of simply loving. And I just went, wow, this is coming from a Christian radio station. I love it. I love the awareness that is coming. And that was all that was said. And it sort of reflects what you said. And I affirm and hope that that is more of the youth and the younger generation that from our hearts we love. So I just needed to interject and say that because it was on my heart. Rabbi Bale, would you like to respond to this question or shall I not? Yes, thank you. The question about the cake, right? Yes, the, the cake. Yeah. Different rules for yeah. private versus business. Yeah. So uh, I'll give two answers. And before that, I'll just a brief comment to what the Reverend said, that uh, you talked about Jesus being killed by a political extremist machine and a religious extremist machine. Um, I find that a little bit problematic position to have in light of 2,000 years of Christian anti-Semitism. Having said that, um, when we go to the cake, can't end the cake and eat <laughs> Meaning, if you choose to live in a society that works according to certain democratic laws, then if you're part of that society, you have to abide by those laws. You don't have to like them necessarily. You may even strongly disagree with them. But unless they hurt you, they kill you, they uh, denigrate your rights, unless they do something actively to take away your fundamental rights that are defended by your democracy, you have to obey those laws. That's my opinion. But we would not be sitting here if that was so simple. And when the issue of the baker came out and all that, I remember thinking, what would I do? In Judaism, you can find a whole spectrum of opinions when it comes to gay and lesbian rights. You have people that are strongly Jewish religious people that will say that they have every right to be that they have every right to marry legally according to the laws of whatever. And they will say it from a religious point of view. Not from a democratic point of view necessarily. From a religious perspective because they will say that they are human beings created in the image of God and the English translation of the word Toefa because as you know the Bible, the Torah was not written in English and so the word abomination is a translation slash commentary and so without going into the etymology of the word Toefa and where else is found, but some relig Jewish religious people will say that has nothing to do with a, a consensual, loving relationship between two men or two women. It's nothing to do with that. What the text speaks about has nothing to do 
with a consensual loving relationship. On the other extreme, you have very religious Jews who would say, absolutely not. That's what's written. That's what's written, and we're going to be very literalist. And I find that often it's this juggling between the more literal reading of the text and a less literal reading of the text. And again, we can find repercussions of this all over. Conclusion of my uh, comment, I think that if this baker, this, if they truly have honest religious belief that it's so uh, difficult for them to go against a deeply held belief and it's a private business. They don't have to be mean about it, but they can explain and say, please understand that you are asking me to do something that goes against my core belief system. And I think that should be respected 100%. Thank you. Yes, in Sir, I think that just as slavery and racism is kind of the original sin of our country, anti-Semitism is also the original sin of Christianity. And my comment in no way was singling out a religion. I'm talking about the capacity of human beings, both their good and their bad to be able to do what we did. So no offense was meant. And if offense was taken, I apologize. Thank you. Okay. Golden rule moment right there. Pin drop. Yeah. Heart. <laughs> Apology, acceptance, understanding. This is why we do these faith forums. And a lot of what occurs within our panel is a deeper understanding and a deeper respect for one another, too, as they can share from the heart. That was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Thank you, both. Thank you for sharing your concern. Yeah. And thank you, Ken, for coming immediately to that. That was, that was a teachable, learnable moment. And I affirm that if we take nothing away from tonight, we take away that and, and just can maybe from our own faith traditions, see how we can model that more in our lives. Tom, did you want to respond to the cake question? Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> well, here's the question if you want to have a look at it. There it is right here, the cake. Or something else. <laughs> is the cake made with Quaker Rose? <laughs> well, um, Generally speaking, and I think I can speak with some authenticity here, generally speaking, um, in, in the, at least in the unprogrammed Quaker tradition that I belong to, um, uh, gay marriage is, is accepted uh, and celebrated. And um, so for, for most uh, Quakers, at least in the Phoenix area that I know of, I think in the Tucson area too, people I know. Um, the, the issue would be, do two people genuinely love each other? Do they have the right to express that relationship? And uh, should they not be impeded in living the life they wish to live? In the Quaker tradition, it's, um, it supports that idea. Um, I have to agree with the rabbi here, I think. If <laughs> um, if this baker truly believes 
that her action will violate the deepest aspects of her understanding of her core beliefs, she, ha she should have the right to express them. Now, not all Quakers would agree with me um, on this. So, hence the dilemma. I read it somewhere, I forget. The history of America, the United States, is a history of religious conflict. Yeah. Um, the Puritans got here because, you know, they significantly uh, were victimized by oppression in England. And of course, once they established their theocracy, they began oppressing other people. So they executed four Quakers in uh, Boston Common after torturing them, and uh, because of religious purity. And uh, so, there is no easy answer, I don't think. But we really need to explore it. Nevertheless. Thank you. Religion was used to justify. Oh, it's kind of loud. Yes. Voice carry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Religion was used to justify the Mahafa. No. We used to call it the Holocaust, but then that was mainly associated with what the Jews had experienced in Takamal and uh, Dachau and all those other places. So among African nationalists, we use African language, and Mahafa means great destruction. So we use the term Mahafa. Religion was used to justify that. When the enslaved weren't Christian, when they brought them from Africa, there were many Muslims and spiritualists and all, they used them. Well, they're not, they're not Christian, so we can enslave them. When they became more Christian than their enslavers, the enslaved, they had to have a justification for them. Well, they're black, they have this, they're, that, they're inferior. Again, the Bible was used with the curse of Ham. So it's a very slippery slope when you progress from color and rather faith being a justification and rationale for enslavement to, well, my faith tells me that I don't want to have to serve you. Now, my history in this country about not being served, colored, white, and all of that, is, is very unique to, to uh, black Americans. But I see that experience coupled and paralleled with my gay brothers and sisters of the LGBTQ because they're experiencing that too. And it's not a choice. Many people think, well, they are, they're gay and they choose to do that. They may choose to engage in a sexual activity, but is sex or gender determined by uh, the plumbing we have or by what's in our head? And I think we'll agree that in many cases it's what's in our head and not what the doctor first sees when the child is extracted from the mother's womb. I take a stand that laws exist in some attempt to go beyond religious faith, but there's therefore the separation of church and state. And these laws exist so people won't be discriminated. And they won't use their faith as a, as a, as a pretext to get away with some ungodly, choice that they're making towards somebody else that they don't agree with. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a final question, um, and I hope that we can answer this, uh, and, and we'll allow some time for, this, uh, for questions from the audience. So I'm hoping that this question won't be too lengthy, the response won't be too lengthy. Um, but kind of brief, but it is, a, it is an important question. Are there any unique historical instances of where your faiths, beliefs, and practices were not in line with secular law? How did your faith respond to such a situation? Um, well, I think this is uh, very relevant to uh, Mormons uh, and the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in a lot of ways. Um, I can say that uh, our, our history early on uh, is rooted in uh, quite a bit of persecution, which is rare uh, within uh, America uh, to some extent, um, at least to the degree that, that we received it. Um, early on, our, our faith, uh, our church was first organized in, in 1830 um, in the East Coast. Uh, but of course, we all know that uh, uh, Utah is the, the hub of Mormonism nowadays. How did this happen? A lot of persecution drove us there. Um, and, and so I'll be brief in, in kind of explaining uh, how, how that kind of went about. Um, 
despite my earlier comment of uh, a lot of Mormons nowadays uh, associating with uh, more of a conservative uh, political um, orientation, uh, our faith in a lot of ways is rooted in uh, a lot of progressive beliefs. Um, early on, we were made kind of unpopular because most Mormons had abolitionist viewpoints. Uh, they had very high notions of Native Americans, for example. Um, they had uh, unorthodox uh, Christian beliefs uh, or just religious beliefs. Um, and we were seen as very uh, clannish, I guess you could say, or communal would probably be a better word. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, that frightened uh, the, the locals uh, who would see our faith growing in, at a pretty fast rate. Um, and of course, uh, they would worry about uh, what kind of political power um, Mormons voting in block might have. And so uh, there's a lot of different factors that play into it. But uh, as far as I know, um, we are one of the few, if not perhaps the only faith to have state legislature passed against us. Uh, the most infamous of which is called the Missouri Extermination Order. Um, uh, that was passed and, and said that essentially making it legal to drive Mormons completely out of the state, uh, to rob, to murder, uh, and do all kinds of atrocities to them. And a matter of fact, that was not re actually repealed until 1976 in the state of Missouri. Now, of course, it was forgotten about, uh, but you know, deep in state legislature, I guess it was still legal to kill a Mormon in that state up until then. Um, and so, you know, we do have a history of persecution. Um, and one of the things that drove us to uh, kind of the Utah Territory was uh, our um, desire to practice and live our religion in peace. Um, and we were forced out of many different states. Uh, one thing that, uh, again, um, made clash with state legislature, uh, some Mormons are perhaps a little uneasy talking about this, but uh, of course, it's our uh, practice of polygamy, or plural marriage. That was very unique, uh, controversial even, and uh, uh, within the Utah Territory, uh, well, at least historically speaking, it was uh, first instituted around 1831 uh, in uh, Illinois. And remember, the, the U.S. hadn't expanded uh, to what we know of today, so when the Mormons moved out, they moved out of America completely. They were forced out of the country. Um, and so, uh, the practice of polygamy within Mormonism has a history dating from around 1831 to uh, officially 1890 when uh, a church issued a manifesto ceasing that practice uh, because there is a lot of uh, uh, pressures uh, for the state of Utah becoming a state. Remember, it was the territory of Utah at the time. Uh, but it was against U.S. law to uh, practice polygamy. And so, uh, you know, people will take different stances on it. Some uh, say it's a revelation, which officially it is held to be a revelation. Others say, uh, more so outside the church, that it was uh, the result of social pressures. I see it as both uh, uh, a re revelation that came because of immense social pressure. Um, but, uh, you know, that practice ceased uh, within, within our faith. Um, and so any member nowadays who uh, is in a plural marriage, uh, they're subject to excommunication or church discipline. Uh, of course, there's still fundamentalist groups, which uh, sometimes get confused with uh, the larger LDS denomination. Uh, but you know that was an instance in which uh, the law was uh, secular law, didn't allow for one of our distinct religious uh, practices. Um, and uh, due to the revelation, uh, we you know, chose to give it up. We, we gave it up. And uh, so at least within Mormonism, that, that's very uh, unique. Uh, and that's a historical situation um, in which we, uh, it was kind of the, the opposite side of the coin there. Um, so, you know, I wanted to, to mention that. Thank you. Yes. So, Judaism is not only a religion. Judaism is a people who do. So, differently than Christianity, that it's a religion. Uh, or Islam, it's a religion. Uh, there is a lot of controversy even among Jews. To what extent are we more a religion or are we more a culture, a people? But definitely, I think that everybody would agree that we are a mixture of the two. 
the question is, uh, are there any unique historical instances of where your faith's belief practices were not in line with secular law? So I will start by saying that uh, uh, you know secular law is something very modern. Uh, before, without going into too much into history, but up until a few hundred years ago, there was no such a thing as secular law. Every law was a religious law. So if we go back in the Jewish history, uh, we were always, uh, you know, we had the, we celebrate Hanukkah not because we like to light eight candles, but because uh, that uh, is, uh, reminds us of uh, a rebellion that uh, we undertook against the Greek Syrian uh, that were occupying our land and they were imposing on us uh, certain laws that were against our laws. And as a result, uh, we went and we did a war against them. And also we did, by the way, a civil war against our brothers and sisters that were allies with the Greek Assyrians. The story of Puri, that's not because we like to copy Halloween, uh, but is because it reminds us of uh, an instance when uh, a lot of Jews lived uh, in the Middle East, uh, in what is today uh, Iran, uh, was back then Babylon, and there was a decree to kill all the Jews. And in that instance, uh, the story tells us, the religion tells us, they were saved by prayer. Prayer is of what saved us. So we have two religious uh, holidays that we celebrate all the way to today. One commemorates a little bit more the fighting against oppression, and one who celebrates more praying against oppression. So we have a little bit of both. If we go again, we continue. Uh, uh, and after the destruction of the Second Temple uh, in the 67 or 70, depending on which historian you ask, we Jews lost our national independence. And so we were third-class citizens everywhere we went. We were third-class citizens in Islam, under Islam. We were considered dhimmis. Uh, and by the way, in Muslim countries were still considered dhimmis. Uh, it means a status of a third, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legal status where you have to pay a certain uh, fee to be able to live as, as a Jew. Uh, that the status of a dhimmi is, uh, is given to Christians and Jews as people of the book. Other religions that are not considered people of the book are just not allowed to, 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 to live or to perform their religion. And in Christian lands, when we lived in Christian lands, uh, again, so we were subjugated to various uh, discriminatory laws uh, imposed by, uh, by, by the church and then by also by the Protestant church later, etc., etc. So it's not for us, it's not only secular law. For secular law, it's something very recent. Um, and, and the response from the Jewish people, historical, the historical response, not a religious response, but historical response, because we were subjects of those countries, we did not have our army, we did not have our uh, ability to defend ourselves, those were not democracies, those were far from being democracies, and if anybody disagreed with the government, they chopped off their head. As a result, sometimes we converted. And sometimes uh, we converted willingly, with the hope of maintaining our religion in secret. And sometimes we were forced to, converse, to convert. And sometimes we ran away. And sometimes we were pushed away. That's our historical, that, that's our history. That doesn't come from a religious point of view. It comes from a practical, that's what the, that's what the situation is. So I don't think that there is a, a true, unique, religious answer. You know, you could go and find in Jewish text, it says if somebody, differently than in Christianity, it says if somebody, you know, slaps or whatever, give the other cheek. In Judaism, we don't have that. If somebody comes to kill me, go and kill him first. 
But that is only in theory for the last 2,000 years because when you live under a dictatorship, and history, the history of humanity is a history of dictatorships, uh, you can't do that. You, uh, you will need to worry about your wife and kids and most importantly how to preserve your people. And so you hide, you run, and you do everything possible to survive. Not probably much different than what uh, your tradition did by running away from the East Coast to the West Coast and what your tradition did and, and, and other traditions as well did when they were persecuted. Tom, Ahmad, or Ken on this question? I'm having a bite of my tongue on this okay. comment, so I'm just going to be chill. All right. chill. All right, so we have a couple, we don't have very long for questions, and these are questions, not monologues. <laughs> these are questions from the audience. If anyone has something that they would like to ask a particular panelist. I think Craig had one, Ron. Craig raised his hand. Uh, just one very quick comment and then I'll get to the question. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a former economist and attorney for 30 years. And I am concerned about how some of these issues are addressed using phrases that are intrinsically economic or legal, but they're used as if we all understand what they mean, even though they're technical terms or technical phrases, like private business. Mm -hmm. um, and I can elaborate more on that in another context if you want. Uh, the question is this. Uh, I think all of the faith traditions represented here at one point or perhaps in a sustained manner throughout their history have identified one of the great evils of the world as idolatry. And yet I hear nothing about that in this discussion. And it, it, at least when I use the term idolatry, I mean something other than God is your ultimate concern. That you worship something other than God. And I wonder if any member of the panel wants to address that. Well, the Quakers, when they first emerged as a, an identifiable community, about 1650 or so, something like that. Uh, but the, by the way, the word itself, the best story I, I, I enjoy is when, yet again, another Quaker's in court for not tipping his hat to his superior. Or, I mean, there are a lot of ways you could get busted in England in the 1650s. Uh, in, the, in the silent worship, it was reported that some people became so entranced with the inner life that they would shake. Okay. And so there, there was a, a good English jurist, I'm not going to pick on the Episcopalians, they're good people. So he anyway, said, remove this Quaker from my side, because they would quake. So that's, I love, I love that story. So, at any rate, um, One of the initial ideas in, in the Quaker faith is that, for instance, the Bible, unlike what the Puritans, the neighbors uh, of the Quakers, believe that every word in the Bible is the unerring truth of God. Uh, the Quaker position was that the Bible is important uh, as a guide, but that words eventually confound a person's spiritual path. So the idea of what's called Quaker mysticism was an important part of our belief system early on. Maybe that speaks to the issue of words being something like idolatry. If you were, the idea for us is that the, if you are bound by words, you begin to shut off other important aspects of understanding God. So that would be my particular response to the idea of idolatry. We 
have just about five minutes left, I noticed, and I know that Larry, Reverend Larry, is going to want to do a close. And so this has been such an I wish we did you have a question, Tony, were you like really wanting to ask? We can we can go for it. We can go for it. Um, real quick before I ask the question, I'm going to do the same thing. I just want to thank uh, Reverend Ken for what your church does as a sanctuary church. I think that's really meaningful and really important. I also want to thank um, Ahmed for the recognition and respect that you gave to our LGBTQ Muslim brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. That's appreciated. My question is for Tom regarding the Quaker Church. Um, so it's been my understanding that in the Quaker tradition's history, um, there's something called, I believe, a consensus model. Um, which is that uh, it requires a unanimous decision for the church to change its official doctrines or, or decrees or its position on a certain issue. And I'm wondering if that's um, something that's been a challenge in Quaker history in terms of um, social justice issues, civil rights, and making progress, or if you see that as something that's helpful, keeping the community together, you know, um, allowing one individual to, to abstain or to stop um, something that they view as being in contradiction to the rules. Quit picking on me. <laughs> um, talk about words. I just want to make a minor correction. Uh, th there are two sort of Quaker traditions. There is the Quaker Church, which is a newer uh, sort of format, 1800s. The old <coughs> Quaker tradition, the one that I belong to is called meeting, Quaker meeting. So we have meeting houses, we, we don't have churches. So um, just want to, if that'll be of any help. Yes, we don't uh, have majority vote when we make decisions, what we call corporate decisions. Corporate meeting in, in the name of the meeting. So it, that's why it's, for some people, frustratingly long. For Quakers to come to uh, to a, a collective sense of how to move forward with something, so the idea is that it's not just we're not just trying to be nice to each other. We're we want everyone's ideas to be heard and to be respected because there is that of God in everybody, even people who aren't Quakers. So. Hence, our decision-making process is a bit more uh, tedious, <laughs> long, and thought out. And then people, actually, we use funny words like season. You need to season this idea. We'll come back next week and see how that will work. So, yeah, so that's, but we do have what we call standing aside. There are members of our meeting who will not agree with the particular position the meeting wants to take, and they will formally stand aside, and be, and that will be respected too. So, does that help? Yes. Oh, okay. Have you learned something tonight? Yes. Has this been a good a good faith form? Let's give all our candidates.
and Reverend Larry will close us on out. If my dear friend Paul Eppinger could be here tonight, he would not be able to sit still. Because this is why the Arizona Interfaith Movement was begun. That we could have this kind of dialogue. Disagree. Have those canon cow moments and yet be able to take a picture together. The dialogue that we have with one another is so critical today. 170 years ago, we had a civil war. Today, we're in a civility war. And we need to find a way to change how we dialogue. This is why we model this. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. Every one of you added so much to this colorful garden. And I appreciate it so much. I, I think as I listen to Tom, and let's see if I can say this right. Kale? Close. Jackson, our first recipient of a thousand dollar agreed check went to Jackson. <laughs> Ahmad has been, well, he's just been part of us forever. And Ken, who is Dr. Paul Uppinger's pastor. Um, I think if I listen to all of these, and I hear the, the discrepancies in, 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 in your faith, and you talk about how the spectrum runs from, again, from one side to another, I think here, here we have, and then in the Christian community where we have, how many denominations? 120 Baptists of some nature, but how in the world can we expect to be able to talk to one another, but we have all this divergency about a simple faith. And then you have all of these other faiths. You think about it. And there's one common thread, and we call it the golden rule. That's how we deal with one another. I'm going to treat you, Jackson, the way I want to be treated. And I'm hoping that it'll be reciprocal, you see. And that's what the Arizona Interfaith Movement is about. And that is spreading the message of the Golden Rule. We became a Golden Rule state in 1983. We uh, became a, uh, a state that has a license plate now that says, live the Golden Rule. If you haven't got it yet, you've got to get it. You have to. <clears throat> so just this last month, the end of August, uh, Scottsdale became a Golden Rule city under the help of Dr. James Campbell, my dear friend here, who was the head of the Human Relations Commission. And uh, we got together with the mayor. And Jim, raise your hand. Thank you. All right. And we had a wonderful event out on the lawn at City Hall. And now, Scottsdale is a golden rule city. If you go down Scottsdale Road, you'll see banners hanging over the whole street at Scottsdale Road. We are a golden rule city. Pretty soon, you'll see blazoned on the police cars, Scottsdale is a golden rule city. So we're just excited as can be, and more cities have come in as golden rule cities, and more coming in. So that's what we do. We try to bring dialogue uh, to the uh, religious community uh, in this kind of respect. Uh, one of the ways in which we help bring dialogue and recognition is we have a calendar. Now this calendar is a specific calendar that has all of the religious holidays of all the major religions of the world. So you'll want one of these. Now, they are expensive. I mean, but tonight we have a sale on. <laughs> and uh, uh, for asking for a one, we'll give you one. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> it's almost, can you believe it? It's almost halfway into the year. Here we are. So this calendar is going to be extinct pretty soon. And we'll be doing another one. But if you don't have one, please, please pick one up. Uh, we just finished our banquet, our Golden Rule banquet, where we honor various people who do Golden Rule deeds in our community. And these are pictures from there, please. This is the only book we have. It's our office copy, but I just bought it along. So if you wanted to look at it, you could. Uh, I want you each to pick one of these up. 
This is a little card that says, I agree to treat others the way I want to be treated by showing respect, kindness, empathy, civility. So this card you need when you're doing that speeding thing that the rabbi <laughs> talked about. Because as soon as you look at your speedometer and see that you're doing that, remember that little card that's in your pocket that tells you, hey, <laughs> but do pick one up. Just be a reminder that this is what we need to do to combat the civil civility war. We need to be respectful to one another. So thank you so much for coming. This has been so informative. We appreciate it so much. If you want to become a member of the Arizona Interfaith Movement, you can just simply go to azifm.org. It's $25. You can become a member. And uh, that helps us spread the message of the golden rule and civility among one another. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful